Thank you so much to the organizers, Alex, and, uh, and the organizers of CMS Astro. I'm truly delighted to be included in the conversation today and, uh, and just very grateful for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Layla. I'm the CSO and co-founder of Biomilk. We're an early stage company based in North Carolina working on technology to produce uh, human milk outside the body as an option for infant nutrition. I'm really excited to discuss how we approach some of the fundamental technical challenges for making a full composition milk outside the body, and also to share some of my thoughts on the implications for this technology, especially related to how I think our products can support human space exploration. I want to start by sharing an image that I found absolutely arresting when I first encountered it around 2013 and a picture that I still find just as beautiful and inspiring today. This is a ball of cells derived from the mammary gland and grown outside the body under conditions that cause them to form this three-dimensional hollow sphere shown in blue and to fill it with a tiny droplet of milk shown in pink. I came across this paper when I was reading about the biology of these cells and wondering whether they could produce milk in culture. At the time, I was a new mom to my second, and for the second time, I found myself reliant on bovine-based infant formula to provide the nourishment for my child that my body could not. I knew that breast milk was optimal, but no matter what I did, I couldn't make enough of it. And despite my ambivalence and the judgment of my doctors, friends, and even family, like so many other moms, I had no choice but to turn to formula. During this fraught time, I was also feeling professionally restless, contemplating how to get back into the lab after finishing my postdoc three years previously, shortly after the birth of my first, and I was becoming enamored, enamored with the emerging field of cellular agriculture. When I started thinking about producing milk outside the body, the 10 years I'd spent as a grad student and postdoc studying how cells control their behaviors in space and time had prepared me to be appropriately wowed when I came across this figure. Before I even read the description, this image immediately and decisively answered my first question. Can mammary cells make milk in culture? It turns out that they absolutely can, and we've known this since at least the early 1990s. This realization quickly led to my second question, which was, can we collect the milk that the cells are making? This would turn out to be a far more interesting and complicated question because as I'll touch on short, like the Milky Way, milk is a complex dynamic matrix of countless unique components, all present in perfect proportion relative to each other. All these components work together as perhaps the world's most functional food to support the growth and development of a mammalian so the proportional relationships of milk components and the kinds of complexes that they make are species specific, and they represent a few hundred million years of evolutionary pressure to reach exactly the right balance. Imbalances in the composition of milk undermine the, the effectiveness of the entire product and will impact developmental outcomes. Breastfed babies receive numerous benefits compared with formula fed babies, ranging from less upset stomach to lower rates of allergies. These data underlie the universal recommendation that babies should be exclusively breastfed for the first six months. We at Biomilk are designing a production process to harness the full molecular complexity of human milk, while a number of other groups in, in this space are also making progress on the production of individual components that can be used to make a variety of dairy products. Biomilk is distinct in our commitment to producing the full constellation, which is especially critical for a nutrition product that's intended for babies. The biomolecular complexity of milk is predominantly the achievement of a particular type of cell that lives within the mammary gland, the mammary epithelial cell, which I'm showing here now grown as a two-dimensional sheet. These cells synthesize the vast majority of components found in milk from precursors absorbed from the mother's blood. And whatever they don't synthesize, they actively transport from the blood into the milk. In this way, they're both the manufacturers and the gatekeepers of milk. The effectiveness of this process depends on the coordination of a variety of mammary epithelial cell behaviors, and the technology that we're developing at Biomilk is aimed at orchestrating these behaviors outside the body. First, the cells must multiply to achieve sufficient numbers to handle the biosynthetic demand required to sustain a growing infant. Second, they must organize three-dimensionally to directionally regulate the process of absorption, biosynthesis, and secretion. And third, they must maintain this impermeable barrier between the blood and the milk. Similarly to the production 
to a bioprocess for the production of cultured meat. A milk production process will include a phase for cell replication to exponentially expand the number of cells, followed by a phase for, produ for production in which the cells are committed to an architecture that allows the directional nutrient absorption and compartmentalized product secretion. This process approximates the process in the body with cell culture media circulating through the maternal compartment as milk accumulates in a product compartment until it is collected from the production system. Unlike cultured meat, our cells are not the end product themselves, but rather they are the producers. This is a significant benefit as it means that we're able to sustain a production run over many months, during which time each cell will reproduce its own mass in milk many, many times over. So in short, I believe the answer to the second question is yes. At BioMilk, we're aiming at the development of a compartmentalizing bioprocess that we believe will allow us to get the milk and only milk out of a culture of mammary epithelial cells. With optimized process inputs, we think this process will, or we think this product will closely resemble human breast milk. We think that we'll be able to produce it at scale, and we think that it will be demonstrably better nutritional option for human babies than bovine-based infant formula. Just in case I'm right about this, I'd like to turn now to an even more interesting, interesting question, which is what might, it, what might it mean if we're successful? What if we really are able to make something that is close to human milk and perhaps a true paradigm changer for human nutrition, for infant nutrition? What would it mean for human potential if all babies on earth and beyond had access to fully bio-optimized human milk, what would it mean for the parents who are caring for those babies doing their best with increasingly constrained resources under circumstances we can't even really imagine today? What would it mean for populations beyond babies who currently can't ethically, legally, or financially access the benefits of literally life-giving human milk? How do we best leverage this product to maximize human potential? I've already touched on the benefits of human milk for human babies, and I've shared a little bit about my own story of how demoralizing it was to be unable to produce enough milk for my own children. Although I've learned since that my experience was entirely common, at the time I felt very isolated. No one seemed to believe me that I wasn't producing enough milk and that my baby was constantly hungry. I was told repeatedly that I should avoid formula at all costs and that the best thing I could do was just keep trying. This advice was meant to be encouraging, I'm sure, but only increased my feeling of alienation as I spent up to 20 hours a day in those first few weeks, alternating between nursing and pumping. At BioMilk, one of the reasons that we're focused on developing optimal infant nutrition is because we recognize that the lack of support for new moms translates directly into opportunity loss for women as they grapple with competing demands of childbearing and launching a career two major life transitions that often overlap in time, resulting in seemingly unavoidable tension that, that neither families nor workplaces have truly figured out how to resolve. The result is that women are pulled in opposite directions and expected to hold it all together. On one hand, my generation has seen the entry of more women than ever into scientific careers. I think we can all agree it's good news that women are increasingly earning advanced STEM degrees. I completed my PhD in 2006 and am proud to have contributed to this increase. And for engineering, the gains were even more striking with the number of women earning doctorates tri tripling between 1997 and 2017. And while these trends should be seen certainly as encouraging, it's important to point out that by 2017, the total number of STEM doctorates awarded to women was still only about half of that awarded to men. Furthermore, unfortunately, these highly trained women are leaving their careers in droves. In tw a 2019 study of over 800 scientists who became parents between 2003 and 2006, 43% of women with full-time jobs in science left the sector or went part-time after having their first child. By contrast, only 23% of new fathers left or reduced their working hours. Strikingly, among a subset of participants who were asked about their decision around Around half of the new parents cited family related reasons compared with 4% of people without children. You might hope that these women are just taking a break when their kids are born, but the data show that when women leave, they don't come back. 
it's also important to note that the publications I've referenced are from 2019, before the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure we've all heard the dismal st statistics describing the toll that, that a year of working without access to the community structures that used to make our lives possible has taken on professional women. And women in science have been hit particularly hard. A former SpaceX engineer and scientist at NASA at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who we interviewed in October of 2020, described the pull of her attention between the technical nature of her work and the needs of her son, noting that despite the challenges, she did not know how she would, would be able to cope with going back to work when it was no longer necessary to work from home. When the virus swept in and turned our lives upside down, something had to give, and more often than not, it has been women doing the giving, giving their time and attention to round-the-clock caregiving, often requiring that they step back from their professional duties. Certainly, human space exploration will require the full force of human potential. Elon Musk recently proclaimed that we will have one million people on Mars by 2050. With such a confident sense of inevitability, as if all of the engineering and discovery required are already given. But such ambitious projections require a healthy pipeline of STEM talent. Unfortunately, as we've seen, STEM is hemorrhaging talent as women minimize or leave the careers that, that they trained for after having a baby. If current trends continue, between now and 2050, over half a million women will graduate with advanced degrees in STEM. Most of them will entertain a long running and fraught conversation with themselves about if, when, and how to have children without derailing the careers that they've put so much energy into becoming qualified for. Some will opt to delay childbearing, some will opt to delay their careers, some will just dive headlong into both. All three strategies have consequences that will be carefully measured in a cost benefit analysis of trade offs, personal ambition, available support, and a ticking clock. This is a calculus that will likely begin in a woman's early to mid twenties. And the answer will be a moving target that continuously uh, is reassessed as her life unfolds. I would suggest therefore that the best way to accelerate uh, human space exploration is to remove the barriers that hold back the female portion of the talent pool who will be needed to overcome technical and logistical challenges remaining to be solved. For example, the women who train as scientists and engineers to do this work, but then don't see the same rates of job entry after graduation or promotion during the early phases of their careers, which ultimately disproportionately affects their lifetime earning potential. This is where Biomilk can help. Biomilk's products will be widely available on Earth in five years. This means that the women who will be our first customers are beginning to have this conversation about having children with themselves right now. Some of them might be in this audience. Right now, maybe you're in college or graduate school. You're beginning your training in a field that fascinates you. Maybe it was that one amazing teacher you had or that weird fact you learned and couldn't stop thinking about. Some, something has hooked you into uh, considering a career in STEM, and now you're somewhere on the path of figuring out what that looks like for you. You're pretty sure you want to be a mom, or you think you might, but you don't really know what it will be like. You've never gone 12 straight hours without a full time, a full night of sleep. You've never, or 12 straight months without a full night of sleep. You've never loved someone so much that you can feel it in all of your molecules. You've never felt the car lifting adrenaline surge that your baby's hunger cries will trigger, and you don't know what it will do to your psychology to have that surge triggered day in and day out for weeks or months on end. It sounds hard, and it is. If I could talk to my younger self, I'd tell her that it would be okay whatever she chose because rewards can be found on any path and fear of regret is not necessarily the best rationale for life's biggest decisions. If I could offer her one thing to help her on her way, it would just be an honest assessment of the challenges ahead, regardless of the decisions about children and all of the support that she would need to meet those challenges. One of the biggest reasons I started Biomilk was to offer support to young women and to feed future innovators. Oops. So finally, let's talk about the future innovators. Imagine this, if Elon is right about colonizing Mars by 2050, then it's theoretically possible that a baby born on Earth today could deliver her baby on Mars in 30 years. I'd like to close by reminding all of us that human space exploration will lead to inter intergenerational space exploration and even permanent colonization. 
If the goal is to inhabit new planets, then obviously populating those planets will be essential. So let's imagine a little girl is born today, April 29th, 2021. Her parents are both researchers dedicated to scientific pursuit and they're well-respected in their fields. Her mother was still at the bench and processing her latest data yesterday, trying to get as much done as she could before her maternity leave. The baby has arrived a little early. She wasn't due for two more weeks. Her room isn't even ready, but she's here now and she's hungry. She roots around for her mother's nipple. And when she finds it, she just spits it out and cries. Her mother gets worried, but the nurses soothe her and tell her that she's doing great. The milk will come and the baby will figure this out. Just keep trying. Eventually they do get the hang of it. And this baby begins to grow. She's at the top of her growth chart with every visit. Her head circumference is in the 90th percentile and her parents love to opine about how smart she is. It turns out they're right. She's very smart. She's curious and creative, bold and brave. She has her own unique way of seeing things. Her first word is moon and she remains transfixed by the night sky throughout her childhood. Her father buys her a telescope for her eighth birthday and she keeps him up late, squinting through the lens, discovering their own comp constellations named after their family pets. In high school and college, she develops into a serious student. Her senior thesis is accepted for publication in an academic journal, a rare accomplishment. She pursues a master's degree and then a PhD in astrogeology. And she studies for her pilot's license at the same time. She's the only, other, she's the only woman in both programs. Additionally, since she aspires to go to space, she maintains a rigorous fitness re regimen. She gets certified in scuba diving and she learns to speak fluent Russian, which remains a NASA requirement for astronauts. She falls in love with a man in her master's program who shares her affinity for space. They marry in 2045 and both take jobs in space flight. In 2047, she spends six months on the International Space Station and in 2049, she and her husband are selected as volunteers for a dangerous but con and controversial mission to study human reproduction on the new station at Mars. And so here we are on her 29th birthday. She's a, she is at the Marshall, Martian base and she just found out that she's expecting a little boy in the fall. Her pregnancy and delivery are relatively uneventful considering that she's on Mars. But then when she struggles to initiate breastfeeding, she finds the process to experience to be excruciatingly, excruciatingly painful due to repeated bouts of mastitis. Even worse, her milk supply begins to dwindle. And within, the, within weeks, her son's growth trajectory takes a downward turn. Meanwhile, her team on the base urgently needs her leadership and expertise to advance the mining and resource generation initiatives that she spent years developing based on her doctoral thesis. The base cannot be sustained without these activities and her inputs are essential. Fortunately, an ample supply of human milk is available from the cell culture, cell agriculture unit. So the decision to transition from breastfeeding is an easy one. And she doesn't hesitate to feed her son this bio-optimized cell cultured breast milk at the recommendation of the base's physicians. And as much as I'd love to tell you more about the life of this little boy that she raises on Mars, here's where we'll leave the story for the day. I hope that I've impressed upon you that the opportunities for cellular agriculture on earth are expansive and can solve more important problems than just what should we have for lunch and that the benefits that we gain from these solutions will only be magnified in space. And with that, I want to, I just want to acknowledge the BioMilk team. Uh, we're, we're a rapidly growing team uh, here in North Carolina. We have uh, a, a group of uh, six on our research and development side. And, um, and of course, my co-founder, Michelle Egger, um, heading our uh, business functions. Um, We've also, I also just want to thank our advisors. These folks have been just really instrumental as we've gotten underway over the last year uh, with, our, with our research and our work. And finally, our funding partners, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Blue Horizon Ventures, Purple Orange, and Shotzi Viserum have all uh, made, made much of the work we're doing at BioMilk possible. 
And finally, uh, BioMilk is, uh, is growing. We are currently hiring for uh, summer internships and expect to be posting full-time positions soon. Uh, so I would encourage anyone interested uh, to reach out and uh, check out our website. And um, from here, I'm happy to take your questions. Great, thank you so much. And you really took us through a visual representation of that story. I'm secretly hoping they will make some sort of movie like that in the, few, in the future. <laughs> we have a couple of questions that are coming in. And uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and submit them. Uh, for anything we can't get to, we will move it over to the Slack channel um, so the speakers can answer there. So uh, first question is really just, you know, where can I buy this? I would love to try this out for my kids. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, it'll be a little bit before uh, we can get this product onto market. We're at quite an early stage now, just uh, just had raised our seed rounds last year and um, are, are getting underway. We, you know, one of the things we think about in terms of the time horizon for launching this product is just how absolutely critical it is that we get the product right. We're trying to feed babies and, uh, and that's, that's, that's a slightly different proposition than some of the other folks working in cellular agriculture. Or, um, to feed a, a human at the very beginning of their life is something that we take really seriously. And so we have a, um, a, a lot of long-term planning around demonstrating uh, the, the safety and efficacy of this product in a clinical setting. And, um, and so in addition to the, you know, the research and development that needs to be done, uh, we, we expect that it's going to take some time before we feel that we have a product that we're, we're comfortable with people actually feeding to their babies. <laughs> we have another question that asks, um, you know, do infant uh, or does infant, infant milk need to differ based on genotype or is it more universal in nature? Well, certainly, you know, humans have a long history of uh, sharing milk among mothers, uh, as well as consuming the milks of other species. And evolutionarily, we uh, benefit from a, 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 the ability to process a strikingly diverse diet. Um, and so while human milk in general has uh, a collection of important characteristics that are associated with ideal outcomes for human and infants. Um, it's also a really variable substance. Even milk produced by the same woman varies uh, from morning to night, or even from the beginning of a feeding to the end of it. So, you know, while while the composition of milk is is highly genetically controlled, it's also very influenced by the environment of the mother and her baby, um, or the uh, the cell culture conditions that we provide at BioMilk. And so, um, so we don't think that there's a particular nutritional rationale that the milk must come genotypically from, you know, from a mother to her child. We have a question from, or and comment from Carmen, who, who says a very inspiring talk to a young female scientist like me. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, what are the biggest challenges for the production of this milk? And actually I'll tie that into another question which uh, is, you know, what kinds of cell culture infrastructure do you foresee will be needed to, for cellular agriculture in space? And so maybe if you could pair those together. Yeah, I think that, um, I think a lot of the challenges here, you know, the, probably the, the technological challenge, of course, is going to be related to being able to do this at a, at a broad enough scale uh, to be able to support the kind of access to the product that we envision. Um, it's really important to us at BioMilk that, that babies around the world and throughout the universe be able to benefit from this product. And so, uh, so achieving that at a large scale is, is quite a hurdle and quite a challenge for us. Um, there are some physical constraints of this, the system that we are currently using that, that will require some significant engineering uh, as well as a lot of optimization work uh, for the cells themselves and, and all of the inputs that go into this process. So, so certainly scaling is, is a challenge that we face some, some unique considerations for making milk compared with making meat. Um, and to scale that process into space, I think, I think is just a translation of all the, all the same challenges we face on earth, but even, even under more extreme circumstances of, of resource availability. I think, um, you know, as we're designing these systems here, 
today, uh, we should be forward thinking about the materials that we're using, what kinds of, um, you know, how, how will we be able to access and, and, and or transport these materials to uh, the locations where we would want to be producing this product. We have one uh, final question that we can get to, which is from Brandon, who asks, what is the time frame from isolating epithelial cells to actual milk production? Yeah, yeah, and this is something that we're, we think that as we get into higher scale uh, cell culture systems will accelerate, uh, but at the moment we are uh, replicating the cells in culture just in a static uh, adherent format and they have a you know a doubling time of every one to two days and we need to get to a certain number of cells before we can can stimulate them to start their production process and that tends to take several weeks at this point so um, you know i would say several weeks to a month before we feel like we're ready to uh, go ahead and, and turn them on.